Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to our preaching once again. I thank the Lord for your faithfulness in attending the, uh, this online service. And um, without further ado, I'll start with um, the topic for today. It's called the truth and positivity. Now, uh, the verses that I chose to lead into the preaching would be Galatians chapter 4, verse 16. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Let us start with a prayer. Lord, we give thanks to you. Thank you, Lord, for the time that you've given to us and the life you give to us today that we can gather, even though online, to continue to learn from your word. And Lord, I'm thankful for the opportunity and also honored and at the same time fearful, even, for, even while preaching your word. Lord, I am not capable of fully understand all your wisdom, but I rely on your Holy Spirit. Lord, may you, may you use me, guide me to speak forth your truth and not my own wisdom. I pray, Lord, that, um, that the listeners, Lord, that the, for those who have not been saved, Lord, that you will work mightily in the heart today, Lord, unto repentance and faith. Lord, I pray for those who have known you, our brethren, Lord, that you would touch the heart of many, encourage, and at the same time, when we are in sin, point that out to us that we may repent. Lord, I give thanks to you for the time. Today, we give thanks and we have, may you, may you have your way with all of us today. We give thanks to you. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, uh, let us start with the first point. Okay, the first point. Okay, uh, wait, let me say, uh, for just now when I read about Galatians chapter 4, verse 16, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? The context of these words is in Galatia where... Uh, where Paul wrote a letter to the Galatians because they were seduced and they were uh, misled and uh, so-called deceived by false doctrines. Um, yeah, while Paul was writing their wrongs and telling them what is the right thing to do and correcting them in, in their doctrines, in the understanding of the doctrines, um, he said this, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So I would, I would imagine that while telling the truth, he would have made some enemies. Some were obviously not happy with what he has said, but we, we also wonder why. When the truth is being told, well, as a Christian, we should know what is the truth. Um, okay, without further ado, I will carry on. Okay, the first item I would like to speak about is humanism and positivity. Now, um, Okay, I took, it, I took some of the quotes from the American Humanist Association on the definition. Um, the very first thing is that defining humanism. You see, humanism is a progressive philosophy of life that without theism and other supernatural beliefs affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good. This is from American Humanist Association. And from the Humanist Society of Western New York, a humanism is a joyous alternative to religions that believe in a supernatural God and a life in the hereafter. Humanists believe that this is the only life of which we have certain knowledge and that we owe it to ourselves and others to make it the best life possible for ourselves and all, and all with whom we share this fragile planet. A belief that when people are free to think for themselves using reason and knowledge as the tools, they are best able to solve these world problems. Okay, these are the words of the humanist proponent and we can identify humanism is a worldview where it is without God, it is without hell, where personal interest, personal fulfillment, potential fulfillment is top priority where ethical decision and ethical life is possible um, without, without God, no, uh, where free thinking is encouraged, 
uh, where knowledge and reasoning are the tools to convince. Now, at the same time, um, we have on the psych- psychology realms, there's a, a, there was an introductory introduction of positive psychology, and this is intimately related to humanism. Now, the science uh, I refer to what was written by Abraham Maslow. Uh, it was written in 1954. He said this: the science of psychology has been far more stressful on the negatives than on the positive side. It what it has revealed to us much about man's shortcomings, his illness, his sins, but little about his potentialities, his virtues, his achievable aspirations, or his full psychological heights. It is as if psychology has voluntarily restricted itself to only half its rightful jurisdiction, and that the darker mean a half. Now, with that, it was an introduction to of positive psychology which was defined to be, um, I read from Wiki, Wikipedia, uh, positive psychology is the scientific study of what makes life most worth living, focusing on both individual and societal well-being. It studies positive subjective experience, positive individual traits, and positive institutions. It aims to improve quality of life. It is a field of study that has been growing steadily throughout the years as individuals and researchers look for common ground on better well-being. Now, I read so many things about humanism and associated positive psychology. Now, I'm not here to debate with a humanist. I don't think I have the necessary vocabulary to, to debate. But what I can do is to give reason from the scripture why I believe that there is a great God who loves every man on earth that he would give up his only son in order to reconcile all men to him. Now, in essence, we can see from all the things that we read just now on humanism belief, we can see that Christianity and humanism is actually, uh, they are both faith-based. Humanism is a belief that there's no God, no spirit, supernatural events and ethical behavior of man is possible without God. A humanist cannot prove God do, did not exist or Christ remain dead. They can only deny, but that's, they cannot prove it. Now the humanist, of course, he can also say that of Christian, that we cannot prove to them that God exists. Uh, we cannot also prove to them that um, that Christ has such power. But the truth is that we can through the, our way of life. Now, but that is harder to convince. And so they can say, Christian. therefore, Christians deny humanism. Now, as we look at experientially, trusting in God is not a, will not disappoint. It has not disappointed any, any true Christian. No, it, trusting in God has put a Christian in dismay. Now, when I say trusting in God does not, will not put a Christian in dismay, it's not, the word dismay is not like how the world see it. There's trouble-free, no worries, always few and not hungry, no thirst. No, that is not. Because as we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 to 10, we see we You see how it was read. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about the body of dying, uh, the dying of Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Now you can see that as a Christian, um, wow, there's trouble on every side. But the Lord, depending on the Lord, that help us not to be distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but never forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. And look at verse 10, it says, bearing about the body of the dying Lord Jesus Christ. He, that is our example, so that the life of Jesus might manifest in our body. Wow, that would means that 
uh, is it this would mean a lot a lot like dismay to a humanist but that is not dismay to a christian now given that both humanist and christian are faith based be- believer and therefore and we have to it's all by faith right so where does that leave us when we come to conversation when a christian come to conversation with a humanist well by asking question and giving reason of our faith why we stand firm with our faith are not this also the virtue of the humanist he asked that every human being should be able to think for themselves and using reason and knowledge well without our conversation would be by virtue of a discussion reasoning asking question now so is what our god do our god do this he who is willing to reason with his creation now i hope we i can make you understand that the lord our god is a creator of the whole world he created even you and me and he's willing to stoop so low to reason with you for what reason that he would like to reason with you is for your own good for you to reconcile with him in isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 it says come now and let us reason together say of the lord though your sin be as scarlet and they shall be as white as snow though they be red like crimson they shall be as wool the heart of jesus christ the heart of god is that he would want you to come to him even though he created you he's above you truth be told we are nothing to him yet we mean so much to him in matthew chapter 23 verse 37 jesus said to those who oppose him oppose god and uh, they be, say they believe in god but yet in their work, in their livelihood in their mannerism they oppose god and jesus say that to them they oh jerusalem jerusalem thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee how often would i have gathered my chicken at my children together even as a hen gather her chickens under her wings and ye would not so the heart of christ the heart of god is that though you be rebellious even killing the prophets the people that i sent to you to tell you to repent and come back to me but you kill them though you are such my heart is still wanting you to come back to me but the decision of the men of some of the men they say he said he would not they rejected christ by their own choice if you go to a minister or uh, the members of parliament now in singapore we have we have members of parliament who will on a monthly basis spend time with the residents of the constituency to sit down with them listen to their woes listen to their problems and prescribe solution Now, when you approach your members of parliament in your constituency, telling them your problem, and would you also tell them how you want to do it to solve your problem, and how you ex- and yet you will expect him to do exactly like what you want to do? Of course not, right? Now imagine you are approaching the prime minister of Singapore and telling him of your problem. Would you also expect him to? put up a solution that is exactly like what you want and they want him to do exactly what you want to do you can't how about christ then so when you come to christ you ought to do it his way now a lot of humanists they are great with words they are very strong in debating but i'm i'm not here uh, i'm not about to reason by words but i can only give them my reply with the scripture whom they from the from the word of god whom they do not believe 
But the Word of God is powerful. Okay, on the second point I would like to touch on is church humanism. Now, in if we look at that, there are basically two types of humanism. Now, I have just defined the first type. The first type is called the secular humanism, which they are unbelievers and they do not believe that there is a God. Now, they, they believe that, as I told you, they believe in the realization of their full potential to the, which is utmost important, which in turn will bring about the greatest happiness for themselves. This one already happened in Genesis chapter 11, when after the flood, when the whole world was still one language and one speech, uh, chapter, uh, Genesis 11, verse 1 to verse 4, see? and it come to pass, as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of China, and they dwelt there, and they said one to another, Go to, let us make bread and burn them truly, and they had brick for stone and slime their head for mortar. And they say, it is, go to, let us, make us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Let us make us a name. Please we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So the part where they build up themselves, build up the self-esteem, Build up the name is number one priority. To build up to the full potential. Thus, we can say that therefore, uh, before we come to be fundamentally changed by God, being born again, before we reach that, before we become, <coughs> before we come to God through repentance and faith, we are all humanists to begin with. Our own happiness is the utmost important. Is is of utmost importance. Now, one might say, "No, no, no. I'm not. I care more about my children's happiness than for myself." Now, I would say your utmost happiness was derived from the happiness of your children. You won't do. A person will not do things that. Uh, the person will not do things that not that will make him unhappy. They will always do things that make himself happy. Now, this is not to say humanists are evil and selfish people who only care about themselves. They can actually do a lot of good deeds, sometimes even to the shame of Christians. But I'm, what I'm pointing here, what I'm pointing out is the, deed that, the, deeds, the good deeds that are done or rather the deeds that are done, whether good or evil, it all points towards one direction, the happiness of the person. The second type of humanism is called religious humanism, in which, in which they do believe that there is a God. But religious humanism is really not much different from secular humanists. The Secular humanist makes decisions so that his happiness is the main focus. The religious humanist makes his service to God, his obedience to God's word, his worship to God, his doing good, his coming to church faithfully, or has all focused around his own happiness. Now, we are all humanists to begin with, so our own happiness matter most from baby to adult. You can see as a baby, I'm hungry, I wah, 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 I want milk. As adult, if I'm not brought up to control myself, I would be, hey, I want this and I want it now. If you don't give it to me, I'm going to make a big scene out of this. Now, even if I'm well educated, yeah, I do, I want it, but I delayed it. But nevertheless, I want it even though it's not good for me. Now, I was a humanist once. When asked if I have a religion, I would always say I'm a free thinker. Now, my, my, my motto in life at the time is work hard, play hard, which is all linked to my own personal happiness. I will not be happy if my work is half-cooked and also not being recognized. I will not be, uh, but I would be happy when I'm out about playing and partying, I let my hair down and play hard. 
But when time comes that cause a person, uh, when the time comes that cause a person to, to consider the need for higher wisdom, some will sought after religion and some of these uh, will come to church. But not in search of God, but in search of a solution to their problem which we can come to John chapter 6, verse 26. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Now they come to Christ, but it is not because they want to follow Christ. It's because they want to get themselves fed. Now, do not get me wrong. I'm in no way despising anyone who come to the church only to seek solution for their own problems. I will even tell you that you come to the right place to find the solution. The solution is not about knowing how relationships should be worked out, how the husband should love his wife, or how a wife should honor her husband, or how, a, how to raise a child, or how to serve God, etc. based on a certain set of formula formula as prescribed in the Bible. <coughs> the solution is to be saved by repentance towards God and faith towards Christ Jesus, allowing God to change your heart. That is a heart operation. That is that drastic. That you possess the Holy Ghost and to have the right understanding of His instruction in the Word and applying it in the wisdom that He gives you with the right attitude that pleases him and the will to obey is what he gave you as well. So even if we look at Acts chapter 20, 21, it says, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That is how you get saved. And when you get saved, see, you change God operates on you. Remove the old heart and give you the new heart. Say, therefore, if any man in, be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, behold, can be seen. All things are become new. And then, in John 14, 26, he said, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you, the Holy Ghost come unto you, help you to remember the word of God, bring you to remembrance. And in verse, uh, in First John chapter two, it says, "But the anointing, which is the Holy Ghost, which ye have received from Him, abideth in you, and ye need not any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even." as it have taught you, ye shall abide in him. The Holy Ghost is able to teach you even when you have no teacher. That is not to say teacher is not important, preacher is not important, pastor is not important, but that is to say that even without the aid of external parties, with the Holy Ghost and the Word of God, you are able to learn. And in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, For it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So when you are saved, the Holy Ghost in you, work in your heart, give you a new will, a new desire to serve God, a new desire to, hey, is this person, does he know God? Is he saved? I am interested to know and I want to share with him not because you want to fill up your chart, how many people you have preached to, you know, uh, how many people you have brought to Christ. No, it's not for your own accolades, but it is for, it is a will that is given to you that you want to serve Christ because you have the same heart as Christ who will everyone to repent and come to reconcile with God. Now, without salvation, one come to the church, got baptized, 
you have merely a religious humanist obey the, obeying the word with his own understanding and own strength and for his own happiness. The churches that, which have been compromised did much to create these religious humanists. How so? Now, I'm assuming the knowledge of the gospel is correct. Because if a church do not have the right understanding of the gospel to begin with, it is a fake church. And for reasons such as fear of dwindling membership, fear of offending parents who would want their children to be baptized, so they're baptized anyway. Fear of drop in offering. Oh, if I offend them, they leave. I, I will not have enough to run the church. That, while they preach, because of all this, they preach repentance and faith. You can hear that in their preaching. But in reality, they are happy to ignore it in practice. So the combination of church allowing humanism to take root and the influx of humanistic members, the church soon become humanistic. And the Bible says in Galatians um, chapter 5, uh, I haven't included here, but I can read it to you. Say, ye chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, verse 7 to 9, say, ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Just a little bit will do. It will soon break out. Once we accept a false idea, it will, over time, fill up the whole church. When we accept it, when we allow it without opposition. Okay, the third point that I want to bring about is positive humanism. Now, one of the modern tenets of humanism is positivity. Now, it was introduced in psychology first by Abraham Malus, which I read to you just now. Now, it is focused on bringing the full potential by not harming the self-esteem of a person. The work, this will work very well with someone um, with someone who's, who has a focus on self, on self-esteem, and fulfillment is more important and their own happiness. Now, over the years, positivity becomes ubiqui uh, ubiquitous everywhere. Everyone, I find this word in the mouth of almost everyone I came across. I can hear about be positive. Surround yourself with positive people. You have positive energy, positive vibes, etc. Now, this is not a matter of just spoken words, but it is a belief system that somehow by being positive, one can keep looking at a bad situation and something good will turn out of it. But somehow by surrounding yourself with positive people, whom, okay, true people, in reality, the positive people to you are the people whom you want them to tell you what you want to hear. You will, by surrounding, somehow by surrounding yourself with positive people, you will have a better day. The question is, yes, you will feel better, but the problem does not go away. And somehow by letting positive being positive in everything we do, with everything we say, or even think, the positive energy will help me to tie over a bad situation. Now, I'm not speaking to believers of humanism and positivity. I'm speaking to brothers and sisters in Christ that this is superstition. Since when did the Bible, the Word of God says, tells a Christian to think positively? Since when? You can search your Bible. None. We are to think upon Jesus. In Hebrew chapter 12, verse 2, see, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The author, the start, 
and the finish of the ending of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. Now facing the prospect of being nailed on the cross and being shamed publicly does not sound like a good situation to me. Yet, nowhere did the Bible tell tells Christ or Christians to think, to think positively and everything will be fine. In fact, verse 1 of Hebrews 12 say that we are looking unto Jesus and the many other past believers as example, like Moses' parents, Moses, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Rahab, who tr all trusted in God and did not trust in positive energy when they're faced with very, very difficult situations. Now, I find it amusing that I cannot find anything else in the Bible to support positivity. Thus, you know, thus, in, thus in, this, in this particular point, I have only one verse. And the verse is also pointing to Christ and not positivity. Now, we move on to the second part of our uh, discussion. Uh, is woes of positivity. Woes of positivity. Meaning to say... Positivity can bring about, human terms is, positivity can bring about negativities. Okay, one, we see positivity leads to lying. Now, if you aim to be positive all the time, whether to yourself or to others, it is inevitable that you will lie to yourself or to others one time, at least one time. Now, and the Word of God says very clearly, Lying is sin and you only need to lie one time to be called a liar. Someone grieving would like to hear encouraging words. Yes, I can understand that. I think everyone would want to be encouraged as well. In Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25, say, Heaviness in the heart of man make of it stoop, but a good word make of it glad. Good word make of it glad. However, however, to give encouragement is not a license to speak of something that is not true in the hope of cheering a person up. It is often, of course, it is often easier said than done. Now, when you are faced with someone who is grieving, what can you say? What would you say? Now, because human tendency is to show love and is to show encouragement toward another who is downtrodden, now, it will, what I say is that it will need wisdom from the Lord to say the right thing. As Christians, our encouragement to another would not, would not, would never, I hope never, depart from the scripture. In Acts chapter 20, verse 32, it said, And now, brethren, I command you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all men which are sanctified. Now, the word of God the word of His grace is able to build you up. Huh? Well, if you are encouraged by words that are not scriptural, that probably will just last you for a while. But the word of God is able to build you up, encourage you, that is bring you to as the song says to higher ground. When one is seduced by the need to be positive, he will want to speak positively in most situations, if not all. But you can be sure it will be void of the Bible. One example is, um, is Micaiah in 1 Kings chapter 22. Um, I can read to you. And uh, this is the time when Jehoshaphat, the king of um, the king of Judah made up with Ahab, the king of Israel, and they the plan to invade a country. And of course, Jehoshaphat asked for a prophet. He wanted to know whether this venture will be positive. So, and Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today, verse 6, 
Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, and they all said together, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And Jehoshaphat said, Is then not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? So you can see, wow, Jehoshaphat at one look, one, gra- one glance, these 400 men, he know these 400 men, they are not worshipper of our Lord. They said, can I have a prophet from our Lord? And the king of Israel said unto Joseph, there is one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Joseph said, let not the king say so. So we can see Micaiah has a reputation of speaking the truth. But speaking the truth to a person at the, at, in the wrong standing, with, on the wrong side of righteousness, caused him to hate him. And we move to 23. See? Now therefore, behold, the Lord have put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets that the Lord may sp- uh, have spoken evil concerning thee. Now, the, 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 the 400 prophets told lies in order to be pleasing to the king. Now, you may say, you may say that the fact that the prophets are lying is because God caused them to do so. But it is true that Ahab was prophesied to die and the dog licked up his blood and the lying by the false prophets, may be the Lord's doing, allowing him to believe and go out for battle and therefore kill in the battle. But the Lord also allowed Ahab to hear from Micaiah the truth. But he chose to listen to the positive lies. As Christians, we know how our Lord hated lying. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 and 17 says, these six things doth, Lord, doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and a hand that shed innocent blood. Now, it, it's very clear. God hated a lying tongue. As Christian, why would you and why would we not hate lying? In Psalm 119, David wrote, 163, he said, I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. It would be a great concern that a professing Christian can lie and lie and feel no reproach from the Holy Ghost. Such a person ought to examine his faith. Second point for this is positivity is fear of man. Now, there was a song written by a brother in Christ, (coughs) John Strader, which tells of a true historic, uh, true history of Baptists being persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church and the Reformed Churches. Now, I have come to know a fellow Baptist thought it too negative and by implication was not willing to sing publicly and was ashamed of the historical records, even though it is true. Now, there is a fear of offending others, which is, in the Bible term, it, the fear of man. Proverbs 29, verse 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Now, look, I'm telling, I, I tell, if I tell people of, Japanese occupation in Singapore during World War II. It does not mean I hated the Japanese. It is history. It is okay to talk about and even sing about. At least we forget the lesson from history. But so I see a pattern of Christians, certain Christians, because of fear of men and being positive, discouraged 
truth to be told or sung. You can imagine if they are teachers or leaders of a church, teachers of a Sunday school, and they refuse for fear of offending in order to be positive, many truths will not be taught or maybe skip and skimmed. There is a snare for such men, but I am not able to know what it is, for it is in the hand of the Lord. But looking inward, there is a snare for myself as well. Should I fear men and discourage truth to be told, I ought, I ought to expect a snare to come upon me soon. Now the same example in 1 Kings chapter 22, we see the fear of the king caused the people under him to only want to speak positive things to him. Even when, when they finally sent for Micaiah and the messenger who went to look for Micaiah said this in 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 13 to 14, he said, and the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, say now, behold now, the words of the prophets declared good unto the king with one mouth. So basically he's saying, hey Micaiah, let me tell you, uh, all the 400 prophets up there already say good things, good tidings will come out of this venture in this war to the king. Uh, Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them and speak that which is good. So uh, you better don't give me trouble. You don't better don't give yourself trouble. Say the same thing, okay? And Micaiah say, As the Lord liveth, and what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. Herein is a beautiful reply. Basically, you are neither telling a lie, or you are not telling a lie, you're just saying the truth. You say, well, uh, without, without agreeing or disagreeing with the messenger. See, as the Lord liveth, the Lord, what the Lord say to me, I will just repeat it. But on the other hand, this is what exactly a Christian should do. What the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. Okay, now we look at the third woes of positivity. Positivity hinders repentance. Now there was a man in the Corinthian church who committed a sin even the unbeliever would, not, would be shocked. That would be in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among Gentiles. Even unbelievers also has, they have gone through, they have fornication. Fornication is having sexual relationship uh, when you are not married. But he said, this guy, he said, he has, he has, he slept with his stepmother, his father's wife. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned, and that he that have done this deed might be taken away from among you. Now, when this thing was done, can you imagine? Day in, day out, there every week they come to meet in the church, they worship, they break bread, or they give tithing, they serve, they sing together, and knowing fully well this man is sleeping with his stepmother who is just the next in another pew. But the people in the church were puffed up. The meaning is proud. It's amounting to haughty. Why, why were they being reprimanded by Paul for being proud and haughty? This is because when among the brethren there's one who sinned in such a manner, even openly having an affair with his stepmother, stepmother, none, none in the church came to the erring brethren to correct him. None stood for the purity of the church, defend the holiness of Christianity. But, the proud, of, but they were proud of themselves for being unso loving. No, I'm willing to forgive this person. I'm willing to include him in my circle because I'm a loving and forgiving person. No? They're proud of being loving, inclusive, 
and forgiving, even though there's no demonstration of repentance from the sinner's part. They thought of themselves being very positive, which is a lie to themselves. So let me also put it into perspective. Now, this proudness sometimes may not be seen outwardly, but when you speak with the person, then you know how much he has disregarded God's admonition and felt nothing wrong about going the opposite direction. Some of these you cannot see until you speak with the person. Now, did the church then prosper because of such positivity? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 to 8 says this, Your glorying is not good. You think you are positive? You think you are loving, you are inclusive? But this is not good in the eyes of the Lord. Know ye not that this little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. <coughs> the church is degenerating to a point where they are proud of themselves for allowing and erring members to continue in the church, patting themselves in the back for being so loving, so inclusive. Surely, love is going to change the person. Love is going to change the whole wide world. But Paul said this positivity will destroy the church. A little leaven, leaveneth the whole lump. And verse 7, he said, Perch out therefore the old leaven, that ye may have a new lump, as ye, have, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The only way to do it is to remove the unrepentant member from the church and fellowship. Now note, this is not cutting ties and never to speak again. This is to watch for repentance. Now we know that the world of such possibility will bring to the church is that the people will be filled with malice and wickedness. These are the things that sometimes if you are a visitor, you cannot see on the surface. In verse 8 of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Therefore let us keep the feast not in the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. But the way of the fellowship that is pleasing to the Lord is with sincerity and and truth. What is truth? John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Simply put, God's word is truth. Which part of God's word? Every part. Positivity demands a person to be sincere. Yeah. But the Bible demands us to be sincere and yet not depart from the word of God. Thank God that the sinning member of the church in Corinth repented and got right with God. He was shunned from the church and the church actually overdid the, shun the shunning. That Paul actually had to come and tell them, stop, it is enough. The man is in a very sorrowful state. So you know, I want you to note that it was Paul who told the church to purge the man. But it is also him who accept the man when he repents. So one can be sincere and sincerity does not mean being nice. It means earnestly wanting to deal with the matter, earnestly wanting an erring brother to repent and get back right with God, with Christ. It has to be done God's way, not your way. Certainly not the humanist way, where the happiness of that person is most important. How much do you know about that person's heart as much as you know about your own heart, which the Bible say, your heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? So doing it God's way is not centered on positivity. 
as the world would have it. It, it would include things like Matthew chapter 18. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And yet so many times when there are offend, offenses, one, the offender would go around talking to others to find whosoever will have the same stand as him so that he could gather an army and come back at the person who offended him. How scriptural is that? Go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Many of the people do not want to be the bad person. Why? Not very positive to do so. So it is positive to go around talking about the other person. Is it positive? But if he will not hear thee, verse 16 says, and take with thee one or two more. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if she shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. All this would sound very negative to a positive humanist. Churches having scandals within the church, such as adulteries, fornication, and hid the matter behind closed doors, sweeping them under the carpet, refraining from blaming the adulterers or adulteresses or even the fornicators, refraining from blaming them, hope that it will go away, is getting more and more common. Apart from doubting the salvation of these erring members or even leaders, people wanted to be positive and do not want to deal with the issue head on. A few years ago, two erring members of the church was disciplined out of the church. But I, want, I will want you to remember that the church discipline is not about cutting ties and not speaking anymore, but it is about wanting to see repentance that we can bring them back to the fold of Christ. Now within the church, There were those who wanted to be positive and continue to pay visit and have fellowship with the erring members outside of the church in the privacy of their homes. The erring members never did repent. And at one point, say they are confused. I am confused. If I am wrong, why why are there still people coming to me showering their love and attention? Brethren, your positivity and your love will change the world belief. It's not from the Bible and it will not help in repentance. It actually hinders it. Next, I want to talk about positivity hinders salvation. Now, as I have said, I was once a humanist big on positivity and I was serving the church in China at the time. I was not born again at the time and for eight long years, I was outwardly a Christian, but without Christ. Thank God I did not perish during that time until I, uh, and then I found Christ at the age of 40. Now, I have experienced churches that would not preach against sin and a lot of time is motivational and informational material I was fed. I personally witnessed young people wanting to become Christians because of the joy of fellowship, the joy of friendship. But there is no brokenness in the spirit because of the sin. Because preaching to the world about their wretchedness, about their sins and the need for repentance, and if not, hell is there, is very, very negative. The positivity becomes a force of political correctness. It is good that people come to the church. But you should not offend them by telling them they are sinners. But I would like to tell you that I didn't for a moment think that I'm not or that I'm even a better sinner than any others. 
And you should not even tell them unless they repent. They were destined for eternal life, uh, eternal fire. We should just preach Jesus is love. That tells a lot about such professing believers who probably came to church and becoming a member without ever being convicted of the sin against God, by Christ, by the Holy Ghost. Don't tell them they are sinners. What saith the Lord? Romans chapter 3, verse 10 and 11 say, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. None of us are righteous. The very person that you dislike, you're saying that he is worse than you, are the same as you, because none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth and there is none that seeketh God, after God. Isaiah chapter 6, In the year of King Uzziah died, uh, died I saw also the Lord seated upon the Lord, uh, a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Then said I, Woe is me. Isaiah saw God in a vision and when he saw God, and he see, what did he say? Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. Who is Isaiah? Wasn't he the, one of the greatest prophets? What did he say? I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. First Timothy chapter 1, he said, this is, verse 15, he said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And Paul say, for whom I am chief. Wasn't he one of the greatest apostles? Yeah, he is. But it did not stop him from ever agreeing with God, agreeing with Christ, who he is. He is a sinner, not better than anyone. If you are saved, you are no better than the unsaved. Equally sinful. What you have is the Holy Spirit to guide you to walk the right way till the return of Christ or till we go to, to Christ when we die. But we, are, we still have the great propensity to sin. But we have a reminder. We have a comforter. Sorry, we have the restrainer, which is the Holy Ghost. I was once asked to preach in a wake because the desire of the family was to share the gospel with their unsafe relatives. But later I was also approached by the head of the family to tell me to go easy on the message, which I perceived that he wanted me to be positive, to remove things like not so harsh, hell, sinner. But what saith the Lord? Luke chapter 13 says, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Repent from even thinking that you are of some good, that you have done enough good to earn admission to heaven. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, the famous verse, For we are all as unclean things, and all our righteousness, even our good deeds, are as filthy rags in the eyes of God, and that we all do fade as leaves, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Now, if you want to depend on your good works, fine. But in the Bible, there are some examples for you to depend on your good works in order to see the kingdom of God. The example would be the Pharisees obeying God's word. Or the example of Pharisee in obeying God's word, not in doing things. But you must, they are ex your example, but you must even do better than them in order to see the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 5 verse 20 says, 
For I say unto you, Jesus Christ said this, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. By that standard, no one can be saved. And you are right. It is a really, really negative news. Now, because it is never about you saving yourself, but God saving you by having Christ taking your place. It took the negative punishment for the sin he did not commit. First Peter chapter 3 says, For Christ also have once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust. The just for the unjust. That he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Now, God's wrath against sinners were then satisfied. Otherwise, God is angry with the wicked every day. Hey, how negative is this verse? It is in Psalm 7, verse 11. See, God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked every day. It is interesting to me that this is Psalm 7, 11. 24, 7, 7, 11. God is angry with the wicked every day. Romans chapter 3, verse 25 and 26 says, Whom God has set forth, to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Now, this is something, mm, something nice to hear now. To declare his righteousness for the remissions of sins. Oh, sins is being, there's the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, that the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Oh, my sin can be forgiven when I believe Christ. Why? Because Christ died for me. He was a propitiation through faith in his blood. Ah, that sounds good. And that is the good news. And the blessed man is the one who need to, he need not need to work for his salvation, but having his faith in Christ's finished work on the cross, dying for him. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. But to him that worketh not, he doesn't need to work for his salvation, but believeth on him just justifieth the ungodly. Huh? For on him, God who justified even the ungodly through Christ Jesus. As it, his faith is counted for righteousness. Such a person, this is... His blessedness in that he believed on Christ, that he is, and therefore he is saved. God justified him because his sin debt has been paid by Christ. This suddenly turns from the negative to positive. I'm speaking as a humanist, big on positivity. It's turning from negative or the hell or the, or the punishment or the repentance, or the sins, and now is being justified. Remember, it's not because of you, it's because of Christ. Without the negative news, every subsequent news that we hear is, are just news. But when there is the bad news, really bad for you, you will wish to hear good news. Positivity will take out the bad news which tells you about the righteousness of God, which is all unrighteous sinners need to hear before they hear about love of God. So love them that even in their unrighteousness, in their unjust condition, Christ, elect Christ, died for them. The modern gospel is, the modern gospel that talks about God's love only is a fraction of the true gospel. It has been perverted. Anything less than a full gospel is another false teaching and it is a lie and it hinders salvation. 
Now, the last point I come to is truth and posi uh, positivity. The first point is, uh, it, first up point is positivity is man-centered. Now, positivity as it is, has it focused on man's happiness, it is man-centered. Self-love may sound very positive. Now, it is not the same, but I want to say is that self-love is not the same as self-respect. Right? But let us look at what the Bible say about self-love. Now, it is a sin. It simply means selfishness with a vengeance. Second Timothy chapter 3 says, This know also that in the last day, perilous time shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Do you think this is a positive thing? If you think this is a positive, I mean, maybe the next, the next characteristic would be positive as well. Covetous, bolster, proud, blasphemer, disobedient to parents, and thankful, unholy, without natural affection, true speaker, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, hady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And the Bible say, from such, turn away. <coughs> so we can see, even some of these sins coexisted with the lover of themselves. This has its origin from Satan, which is the king of all about me. In Isaiah chapter 14, 12 to 15, we can see when in the word of God, God says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, the son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which this weaken the nations? Lucifer was first created as the chief of angels. He is most beautiful. He is A. He is, he is an embodiment of musical instruments. He is music. But you see, what happened to him? God said, what's wrong with him? He said, for thou hast said in thy heart, see, you may not need to say it out, but it is inside the heart. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit down upon the mount of the congregation in the sight of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. I will be like God. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. So we have to watch the me-centeredness, the man-centeredness, especially myself, has its origin, not from God. The second sub-point is truth is God-focused. Now truth is, has a focus on God and his word. Oh, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. Search the Bible. There is no such words as positive or negative, but the word truth is, uh, has appeared 237 times. And the truth is, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So in ignorance, you need the knowledge of the truth. And that's doctrine. In sin, you need to be reproved by the truth with an attitude that's pleasing to the Lord. In error, you need to be directed to the right path. In all, in, all, in everything else, you need to you need to be instructed in God's righteousness. Least you fall into standing on your own righteousness and judging others according to your own righteousness. 
truth spoken may be perceived as negative or positive is depending on where you stand. You won't feel good listening to God's word when you are in error. And that is precisely important for you and me because this is the working of the Holy Ghost convicting us of our conscience. You can treat it as a negative comment by a preacher or you can meditate upon it and repent. Don't let pride get in the way. The same truth, which was perceived as negative by one, can at the same time be an encouragement to another because of where they stand, whether they are in error or they are in truth. The same preaching have men shouting, Amen! And have men smoting in their hearts. And have men got really offended, thinking that the preacher is preaching against them. It's all about me, you preach. Why, why is that? God has, as we, we know, God is no respecter of person. Neither is his word. His word is for everyone. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse, uh, sorry, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, that it shall prosper in the things whereto I sent it. The word of God, which is truth, even the same words can convict, can comfort, can offend at the same time to different people. The issue is not with the word of God. The issue has been the hearts of men. Where do they stand? To the truth loving brothers and sisters, the Bible warns us not to be seduced and fooled by worldly wisdom. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 to 8, it says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so Walk ye in him. Walk ye in him. To be guided by him. To be spirit-led. Rooted and built up in him. As we know, what can build you up? Build you up? His word. The word of God. And you need to be rooted in that. That it will build you up. In Christ. And established in the faith. It will help you to stand firm, standing on the promises. And ye have, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of man, man invention, after the rudiments of the world, things that follow the world are not the, not the word of God and not after Christ, you can see philosophy, vain deceit, traditions of man, rudiments of world. They are not after Christ. That ought to give you a place where that ought to, sh or, or rather, that ought to show you that there is a line drawn where you ought to stand. It's your choice. So, but the choice for the child of God is clear because. He cannot worship God with half-truths or with a spirit of lies. In, the, in John chapter 4, I will end with this, John chapter 4, verse 23. This is when Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman and the woman said, Oh, oh yeah, you, you Jews say you must worship in Jerusalem, in the temple, but uh, my ancestors tell me to worship in that mountain. So everybody say something, right? I, uh, this is how I believe it. But Jesus said, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is the Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. What is truth? Thy word is truth. So, I hope the word of God would be able to encourage us to stick and focus unto His word. 
and His Word alone. Have our eyes focused on the Christ and not onto worldly philosophy, rudiments of the world, and man's tradition. So the question is, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Now some final thoughts. Concluding thoughts. One, humanism and positivity has it focused on bringing about happiness to man and to his full potential. Humanists in church are created because of influx of humanist members without diligent check on genuine repentance and faith by the church leaders. Even the church members, they are not free from responsibility. Christians can be seduced and deceived by this, wor by this worldly philosophy of positivity. Positivity can lead to lying. It's a form of fear of man. It hinders repentance and salvation. Christians need to spot what is truth and what is philosophy and choose for themselves. Positivity is man-centered while truth is God-focused. Okay, that's all for today. Uh, thank you for your time. Let's end with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we give thanks to you for, for the word that you've given us today. I pray, Lord, that um, you give us, all of us, a diligent spirit, also a mind that think for themselves and to align according to your word that they, be, that they would not take what is being preached today as if it is truth, but rather would open up the scripture, the search the scripture and find out whether it was so. I pray, Lord, that you would use your word to convict those who have not come to know you. Lord, that by your word, pricking the hearts of those that they need Christ, they need a savior, that their effort to do good can only help them with feeling good, but not helping them eternally. Lord, I also pray for Britons uh, who may be sinning. Lord, I pray that Lord, you give the encouragement and firstly, the, the pricking of the heart for unto repentance and Lord, that they may come back uh, to have a fellowship with you and to see and to feel the real joy and not to seek joy from sinning. Lord, and I also pray for pray for all the other brethren, Lord, that you would use the word to encourage, Lord, to continue to stand firm and focus unto Christ Jesus alone. We give thanks to you, Lord. We pray in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, thank you everyone.